Welcome back. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. Our next speaker is Adam Lieberman. He is the head of artificial intelligence and machine learning at Finastra. Please join me in welcoming Adam to our virtual stage. Hello, everybody. My name is Adam Lieberman, and I'm the head of artificial intelligence and machine learning at Finastra. At Finastra, we build and deploy innovative next generation technology on our open fusion software architecture and cloud ecosystem. I work with our data science teams to develop machine learning based solutions across our many lines of business. Algorithmic fairness is a big topic and has never been more important. And I'm excited to be here. So let's jump right in. Our agenda today will consist of seven sections. We will start with the typical machine learning focus and identify areas where algorithmic fairness should come into play. We will then narrow into fairness, define it, and better understand what it is. We will discuss why it's important from an algorithmic perspective and identify ways bias can slide into our models. Next, we'll discuss a few ways we can measure fairness. We'll follow up with some of the latest research around adversarial learning, which leverages deep learning to help build more fair models. And finally, we'll discuss what we at Finastra are doing with algorithmic fairness. So let's get started. The lending industry is packed with data. Every day we are collecting more and more data in structured and unstructured formats and pumping databases with billions of detailed records. Data is really the lifeblood of AI and it's the fuel to the AI rocket that is taking us on the journey of transforming the lending industry. Leveraging artificial intelligence, we are flipping the script on traditional lending. AI is allowing us to automate and create more accurate decisioning, increase processing efficiency, reduce internal operational costs, and create better and more personal experiences for our customers and clients. Artificial intelligence is powerful and proving to really change the entire lending industry. We've been solving some amazing problems with machine learning. For example, we can leverage optical character recognition and natural language processing to parse documents required in the lending process and extract information to pre-populate front-end POS systems. We're using machine learning to help automate the mortgage decisioning process. We have access to billions of data points to better understand our customer base and create smarter marketing campaigns. And we're challenging the traditional FICO score using machine learning to better assess the credit invisible. AI and lending has accomplished a lot and machine learning is really playing a role in changing and transforming the lending industry. Now as data scientists and machine learning engineers, we have a very specific pipeline we all know and love. Data is the heart of modeling. So we start by exploring our data sets, identifying relationships. Uh, we go through exploratory data analysis and turn the data into a usable form. We spend time wrangling, cleaning, pre-processing our data, and then go through intense feature generation to create more useful descriptions of our data for the problem at hand. We experiment with different models, tune parameters and hyperparameters, validate our models and repeat this cycle until we've met our desired performance metrics for the problems at hand. We then focus on deploying and productizing our models as well as maintaining them to ensure that they are running properly and are adaptable in our production environments. However, there's one thing a lot of us typically don't think about or ensure when we meet in our ML pipeline, and that's model fairness. Ensuring that the decisioning of our models is fair from the populations we model from and does not discriminate against particular groups or individuals. Algorithmic fairness is a hugely important topic, especially in the lending industry. And in this talk, we're gonna discuss it in detail. With such a focus on the machine learning pipeline and building robust and more generalizable models, there's one quote I love when it comes to bias and fairness in the algorithms we use. Algorithms don't remember incidents of unfair bias, but customers do. So what exactly is fairness? Now, fairness is a complex and multifaceted concept that depends heavily on context and culture. Every problem is unique and has unique sets of data. A use case around using AI for credit scoring is different than a use case around customer segmentation for marketing efforts. Thus, there's not one true definition for algorithmic fairness. In fact, there's many different ways to define fairness that can stem from statistical and mathematical definitions or legal definitions from the problem at hand. Different definitions of fairness can produce entirely different outcomes. So you might say, hey, Adam, you know, that's not so helpful. There's not one definition for algorithmic fairness. Come on, give me something. Um, so one kind of attempted definition that I like is, in machine learning, an algorithm is said to be fair or to have fairness if its results are independent of given invariables, especially those considered sensitive, such as the traits of individuals 
which should not correlate with the outcome. To sum this up, we could say something like, an algorithm has fairness if it does not produce unfair actions or representations for our individuals or groups. Speaking of individuals and groups, there are many definitions that focus on individual fairness or group fairness. Individual fairness focuses on ensuring that statistical measures of outcomes are equal or similar for individuals, or more simply, similar individuals should be treated similarly. If you and I are very similar and we apply for a loan, then we should have a similar outcome. Group fairness partitions a population into predefined groups by sensitive or protected attributes, for example, race, ethnicity, gender, and seeks to ensure that statistical measures of outcomes are equal across groups. In more simple terms, model predictions should be equitable across the different groups. For example, if we look at groups divided by gender, then similar decisions should be made for the groups as a whole. One gender should not be favored over another. Now, there are two worldviews with some associated acronyms. We're all equal and what you see is what you get. The we're all equal worldview states that groups have the same abilities, so any structural bias being different should not be mistaken for difference in ability. The what you see is what you get worldview states that observations reflect the abilities of groups. Now that we understand fairness and have conceptualized it, let's understand why it's important. Here we see four cases where algorithms have been used to make a decision and have exhibited unfairness to groups and individuals. We have seen issues with insurance companies using machine learning for insurance premiums that discriminated against the elderly. We've seen online pricing discrimination and even product personalization steering minorities into higher rates. A quick Google search against algorithms and bias will pull up hundreds of examples where models were not tested for fairness before they were released into the wild. The point is, Bias is prevalent and is all around us. And when customer trust is lost, there's no guarantee we can get it back. You know, speaking of that, our customers are aware. When customer trust is lost, we really can't get it back. Here's a few quotes from individuals who have experienced algorithmic bias firsthand. It's totally unfair because not every woman is the same. They've already labeled me as a low-income person. The bank said I can't afford a $950 mortgage, so I pay $1,400 rent instead. Our customers are aware algorithmic unfairness occurs, and if we are to put lending models that affect the lives of our clients and customers, we need to ensure we test them for fairness. And even more, there are feedback loops. The decisions made by unfair algorithms can be propagated as training data, which our models are again, learned from and evolved from. This feedback loop can cause a vicious cycle that propagates biased data. We need to be very careful about bias models and potential feedback loops to prevent reinforcement of bias. For motivation, I took some publicly available Humda data and a popular adult income data set and built some preliminary machine learning models. I left the sensitive attributes out, make sure I had balanced data, created some great features and got some really good performance. If I didn't know anything about fairness, I would say, hey, these are great models. However, I did some inspection into fairness. Looking at the Humda data on the left, I examined race. We can see the probability of a loan being accepted given race. Looking at the difference between the orange and blue area, here we can clearly see that the probability a loan is accepted given the race is white has a much higher prediction distribution than non-white. If this was fair, we should see the lines having very little overlap. As we get into the presentation, we're gonna see how the use of a few methods can reduce this difference in classes. So what can cause bias and lead to model unfairness? One thing we have to accept is that data can be inherently biased. Data collection is an amazing and fascinating field. There really is a science to collecting and maintaining high quality data sets and many different methods to gather it from machines and automated systems to physical me measurement and collection by humans. We need to understand that our data can be inherently biased without us even realizing it. As humans, we have made historically biased decisions that can spill into our data. We have different data in different regions of the world that could be collected differently. We leverage machines and devices that can be inaccurate for particular groups. The point is, our data that we think is bias-free could indeed have the bias already baked into it. And if we train on biased data, we should expect biased results. 
Machine learning is designed to model a population, and if we supply biased or unfair data, we should expect unfair results. Bias in, bias out. Now, it wouldn't be possible to list every single way that data can become biased, but let's go over a few ways that data can become unrepresentative of the target population we're wishing to model. The first thing is missing data. Sometimes we leverage fields of data that are not available for particular groups in the population. We can have sample bias where the samples we choose to train our model do not represent the population we want to model, like the diagram on the left. Exclusion bias can occur when we delete or choose to not include data because we think it's unimportant. Measurement bias occurs when the data collected for training differs than that in the real world, or when faulty measurements result in data distortion. And label bias is common at the data labeling stage of a project. Label bias occurs when you label similar types of data inconsistent. Now, data is not the only thing that can lead us on a path to unfairness. When we have a machine learning related task, we want to maximize performance and minimize errors. Right? We want a model that has great performance, not a model that has poor performance. However, when we focus purely on performance and the objectives of the algorithm, we can introduce bias from our learning objective by benefiting a majority group over a minority group. We need to define appropriate measures in terms of data and algorithmic objectives to ensure all groups are bias free. Instead of looking at purely performance related metrics like accuracy or F1 score, we can optimize for a particular fairness metric which we'll peek into in the next section. But just because we leave sensitive data out of our models does not mean that models do have links to sensitive data. Related fields can serve as proxies that can be linked to this sensitive data. For example, we know gender, ethnicity, and religion are not to be used in a lending model designed to predict mortgage approval. However, if we use postal code or name in the model, we could potentially derive things like ethnicity from the postal code and gender from a name. These can serve as links to the sensitive data we originally left out. When constructing features, we might think we are removing bias from the sensitive fields. However, there can still be links to them and this can introduce bias. So now that, now that we know that bias can leak into our data and spoil our models, let's discuss a few fairness metrics. Like there are many definitions of fairness, there are many, many metrics of fairness that we can use. Here's a list of just a few metrics. There are some generic metrics, some metrics specific to group fairness, and others specific to individual fairness. Sometimes we need to create our own metrics, and for other use cases, we can look at some out-of-the-box calculations like we see here. We don't have time to go over each of them individually, but this is a nice list of just a few that are popular. To explain a few of the fairness metrics, I want to illustrate an example. Let's say we're a financial institution and we're building a credit classification model for granting or not granting a loan. Our historical data contains those who paid off a loan and those who defaulted. We say that we have two groups, A equals one and A equals zero. Our ground truth data points are below, where eight out of 10 people in group A equals one paid off a loan and four out of five people in group A equals zero defaulted. We will let the green circle denote Y equals one with the loan being paid and the red circle denoted as Y equals zero being a defaulted loan. We will let our predictions in the following examples be blue circles and be denoted by Y prime equals one for a prediction of a loan being paid off and a yellow circle Y prime equals zero being a prediction of a default. The first metric we'll look at will be called demographic parity or commonly known as statistical parity. The idea here is that each proportion of each segment of the group should receive the same positive outcome, which is loan approval at equal rates. So each group of people should have the same percentage chance of receiving the loan. So below are the predictions. The model predicts that the first eight people in group A equals one will receive the loan. The model predicts that the last four people in group A equals zero will pay off the loan. Well, we see that we have eight out of 10 equals 0.8 predicted to pay off the loan in group A equals one and four out of five equals 0.8 predicted to pay off the loan in group A equals zero. And if we look at this difference between the two groups, it's zero, which is a great way to satisfy demographic parity. The next metric is equal opportunity. With equal opportunity, the idea is that each group should get the positive outcome at equal rates, assuming that people in the group qualify for it. It's like saying, hey, you can join our dance group, assuming you can dance. What we do is look at our ground truths 
And those are the ones that are actually the positive outcome. We look at the predictions that were positive and compare the probability of positive outcomes across the two classes. To make this easier to understand, let's go back to our use case. Again, you can see the predictions of our data points for the two groups. This time we added green and red bars above the data points to the label Y equals one and Y equals zero for the ground truths we showed in the use case. To compute equal opportunity, we see that for group A equals one, of the eight predictions, eight were actually ground truths of Y equals one. Looking at group B, we see that of the two predictions, only one of them was ground truth of Y equals one for paying off a loan. So this is the only one we care about. Even though we had a false positive, we still see that the probability of our prediction being one, given group A equals zero and ground truth of one, equals the probability that the probability of our prediction for group A equals one is one with the ground truth of one. So we satisfy equal opportunity here. Equalized odds is a combination of statistical parity for true and false positives. It requires the outcome to be independent of the protected class for the groups, conditional on the actual ground truth. Here we have the same true positive rate and false positive rate for each segment of the protected class. To illustrate this, let's look at the true and false positives of the two groups, A equals one and A equals zero. Notice that in the first group, all those with Y equals one were classified as positive as paying off the loan. Similarly, in the second group, all those classified as Y equals one were also classified as positive. Of the population A equals one that obtained Y equals zero, one of these was classified as positive, giving a 50% false positive rate. Similarly, in the second group, two of these individuals are given positive prediction corresponding to a 50% false positive rate. Here we can see the false positives and true positives match up and equalize odds is satisfied. Now, we only covered a few popular fairness metrics, and we did it very quickly, um, but there's many to explore. It can sometimes be overwhelming, especially when you're first diving into the field of algorithmic fairness. The University of Chicago has created a fairness tree that you can trickle down to find which fairness metrics you should look at. Let's now briefly discuss adversarial learning, a way to help improve the fairness of your classifier. Before we get into adversarial learning, we need to talk about GANs, which are called generative adversarial networks. The idea behind a GAN is simple. We have two neural networks, the generator and the discriminator, who are in a sense playing a game against one another. The generator learns to generate plausible data, fake data that looks real. The generated instances become negative training examples for the discriminator. The discriminator learns to distinguish the generator's fake data from real data and the discriminator penalizes the generator for producing implausible results. When the training begins, the generator produces obviously fake data and the discriminator quickly learns to tell that it's fake. As training progresses, the generator gets closer to producing output that can fool the discriminator. Finally, if the generator training goes well, the discriminator gets worse at telling the difference between the real and fake data and starts to classify the fake data as real data and its accuracy decreases. Now, we can leverage the methodology of GANs to help improve model fairness, and we call this adversarial learning. We start by taking our data for a classification task and building our features and targets and build an initial classifier. We also see in the diagram that we have our sensitive attributes kept separate. They are not included in the classifier training. We then pre-train our adversarial on the predictions of the classifier we just pre-trained, Thinking about the GAN we discussed on the previous slide, the adversarial network doesn't distinguish real data from generated synthetic data in this case. However, it tries to predict the sensitive attributes values from the predicted labels from the aerial classifier. Both of these models, the classifier and the adversarial network, train simultaneously with an objective to optimize the prediction losses of prediction labels and sensitive attributes. We have a predefined number of iterations or cycles for training and hopefully at the end of the iterations, we have a model that is more fair. Let's go back to the motivational example we showed a few slides ago. On the left, we have the loan approval model built from the Humda data that had great performance, but an advantage to one race over the other. On the right, we have the adversarial training for 100 iterations, and we can see that that gap has been highly reduced between the races. So now let's talk a little bit about fairness at Finastra. 
The Home Mortgage Disclosure Act requires financial institutions to maintain, report, and publicly disclose loan level information about mortgages. This data helps show whether the lenders are serving the housing needs of their communities. They give public officials information that helps them make decisions and policies and shed light on lending patterns that could be discriminatory. Rather than sift through tens of thousands of loans manually to identify potentially biased loans, our lab team built a proof of concept called the Loan Analyzer to do this work automatically. This can help ensure institutions are lending fairly and complying with CFPB. This concept is something we're investigating the potential to turn into production. During the 2020 Vista Global Hackathon, one of our financial teams developed FinEqual, an application that uses neural networks to promote bias-free lending. The FinEqual team won best overall app at the hackathon this year to push finance to be open for all. Hackathons are a great way to test our research in algorithmic fairness. Now, speaking of hackathons, for International Women's Day, we are sponsoring a global hackathon with the goal of challenging bias in FinTech and redefining finance for good. All participants are welcome, and we would love to have you join us and hack together to overcome bias in FinTech, research and develop the latest in algorithmic fairness, and enable women globally with financial inclusion. Registration opens up on March 4th, and we'll hack together for one month. Anyone that's interested in learning more, please reach out. Together we can build the future. Algorithmic fairness is a huge area with many different areas to explore. Please reach out to discuss ideas, potential ways we can work together, projects that we can collaborate on, and let's build the future of finance together. It has been a pleasure discussing algorithmic fairness. Thank you all so much for being here. To get in contact and further discuss, you can reach out to me at adam.lieberman at finaster.com. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you for sharing these, these awesome insights with us. We really enjoyed your presentation and the audience is giving you a huge virtual round of applause. All right, for the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. So go ahead and check out your agenda and along the way, make sure you're uh, accepting your connection requests and checking out our AI exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around.